the biblical doctrine of final things has as a subheading to it the final abode of the wicked, which as you put together the teachings of the scriptures on the topic, you'll see that that will take place at the end of the world following the great judgment day where God will consign the wicked to eternal torment and the righteous to life eternal. It is the Gehenna, the Greek word, hell, meaning not the place of departed spirits and temporary torment such as where the rich man went in Luke 16, but it's following the resurrection of the righteous unto eternal life in bodies likened to the Lord's glorified body, as we talked about this morning, and then the resurrection of damnation. Now, not much is said about the resurrected body of the wicked, but I know this much. It will not be, it will not be like the resurrected body of the saints. I don't really want to know about it. All I know is it's capable of being described in the place of outer darkness where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and when men enter that, they do not come out ever, ever again. All hope is lost. That's just the way it will be from then on. When we look at Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 25, while he gives us a picture of those who are welcome into glory, he also gives us a picture of those who are lost. And he says at the end of that, at the end of the chapter, in verse 46, concerning those that he pictures as goats on his left hand, who are, pictured, who are figurative of the lost. He says in verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. Hell is a real place. It's a prepared place for certain people, a prepared people, just as heaven is a prepared place for a certain prepared people. And you can read about that description in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. There are other places that describe it. And I want us to keep that in mind because there's a lot of discussion going on that. The atheist who says there is no God, thus there is no spirit, thus there is no final abode of the wicked, which means there's no final abode of the blessed either. But I think there's something about this that when we let the wisdom of the Almighty God sink in on us as revealed in the Scriptures, and we do a little thing thinking about it, that we might understand a little bit more about this, and it will help us answer the problem of evil, and also satisfy the intense yearning that we all have for complete and final justice. So I want to study about that with you for a while. And in order to do that, we want to look at the problem of evil just for a moment. And I'll sum it up by pointing out that the problem of evil is the question of how to reconcile the existence of evil and suffering with the omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and omniscient God, a God who is love. There are, as there usually are among philosophical discussions, different definitions of these concepts, but I've stated basically what it is, and if you go back into study of the history of philosophy, you'll find out that the Greek philosopher Epicurus was the one who came up with this idea, but it was popularized by David Hume back a couple hundred years ago thereabouts. 
And we want to talk about that just for a moment. But I also want to point out man's longing for justice. I want to mention that a minute. How is it that we long for justice? Think about that for a minute. I have to ask what justice is. We'll get into some of that later. But why is there within everybody, regardless of their error in understanding what justice is, why is there a longing for justice? All these people run around in the streets wanting things that are really contrary to God's will. They're crying out for justice. You notice that? All sorts of folks, no matter how wicked they are, how good they are, we want justice. So we need to understand something about God being a just God. And I'll give you a little inkling here. If there is no God, there is no just God, and there won't be any ultimate justice. Think about it. Leaves it up to man. Humanism says man's a measure of all things. In fact, I heard a philosopher just last week say, Now, if man cannot come up with a code of moral conduct... To govern men, then he's really not man after all. Now, such as that is ridiculous, but nevertheless, that's where you get when you get with some of these people. I want us to first look at how hell helps answer. Listen, hell helps answer the philosophical problem of evil. Remember, they're going to say, well, if evil's in the world and suffering because of evil, yet you say God is love and God is benevolent and God's all-powerful, God's all-knowing, why doesn't he do away with evil? And if he doesn't do away with evil, he's a can or he won't. What kind of God is that? That's the way they reason. But you'll notice every one of these fellows, as I've said all along, and I believe it, are really very agitated and even angry because they are not God. You watch every one of them. They want to call the shots. God must dance to their tune. Well, we're all human beings, regardless of whether we have PhDs or BVDs, one or the other. Or no Ds at all. <laughs> we're all human beings. Moved to use the terminology of the Bible by the same passions, rational Thinking people, whether we do so or not. That is, whether we use it or not, much. That means that when I start talking about God ought to do this and God ought to do that, and if God was here, he should do that, or if God wasn't, all that stuff, that I'm trying to look at God as a human I'm trying to make him over in my image, limited by time and space, physical things. I put him in that. But God's not. God inhabits eternity. God has no beginning or ending. He is the first cause that is uncaused. Well, they don't want to admit that. If they ever admit that God is and God created them, as the Genesis account of creation says... They have to admit it's God's creation. They're accountable to him, and there's the rub. They do not want to be accountable to God for anything they think, say, or do. They don't want to think of a judgment, so they're against all of that. And the easiest way to do it, do away with God. Then you've got to give an explanation of how we got here, because it's obvious even to them we're here. At least some philosophical schools would even have you doubt that. I'm reminded of the student who had been thinking about the fact of am I really here he comes up and delivers his final exam to his philosophy professor and lays it down there and looks at the professor and says am I really here and the professor looks over his glasses back at him and says who wants to know philosophy that tends to say use the brain you got Therefore, somebody said, I think, therefore I am. But notice this, hell is not then a problem for the Christian. The final abode of the wicked is not a problem 
for the faithful child of the living God as you read of it in the New Testament. It's a big problem for the atheist, and I need to ask the question, why is that the case? Because the Bible, the Bible itself, if you what the Bible is, is all about the problem of evil. It starts in the third chapter of Genesis, and it doesn't end till the last word of the Bible. But here's the interesting thing. It gets solved. That's a wonderful thing to announce. When you announce the gospel of Christ, you're announcing God's solution for evil. It gets solved. The Bible has much to say in response to evil. We won't try to go into all of it. We couldn't and wouldn't now anyway. But what I will emphasize now is this. What I just mentioned. Let me emphasize. I said emphasize, so you already heard it. In the end, evil is forever and completely defeated. Now, I said the atheist wants to be on, wants to put God on our time and our limitations and seeing things as a man does. But even Peter said 2,000 years ago, you think they'd learn it by now, <laughs> that a day is with the Lord is a 1,000 years, a 1,000 years is a day. Meaning that time has nothing to do with God. He created it, he works in it, out of it, and he'll bring it to an end someday. There's a day coming when all wrongs will be made right. There's a day coming where there will be complete reckoning for the actions of all. Now you say sometimes we don't think that much about that, but that's because we don't think a lot about sometimes, about things we've used and participated in a whole lot over our lives. Now Brett, you sing this, I think, more than the other song leaders, but we all sing it here. And I want you to think about what I've just said, and then I want you to think about this song. It's an 18th century hymn. I think it sums up what we're trying to say at this point in our study. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and her earth and heaven be won. Emphasis, the battle is not done. We're still in the battle. We still need to put on the whole armor of God. We still fight the fight of faith, to use Paul's terminology. Now the point that we need to know is that Christians have no biblical reason to be surprised by evil. That's what we fight against all the time. That's why Christ came. We needed to have a victory over evil. But he's not going to do that according to man's timetable or how man might do it or man's viewpoint. So when atheists come up and say, oh, you got a problem with God being what he is, a loving God that's omnipotent and omniscient, and yet there's evil in the world. There must be something wrong with that God. He lets it stay here because if he could... Remove it, he would, but if you can't, he something else wrong with him. So there you are, you got a mess. But it's only a mess to those who want to make God a superhuman. And that's all relegated by time and space and material things. God will take care of things when he gets ready. And thus, he knows when to call time to an end. He knew when it came to the world, he destroyed by the flood. We may get a little picture of how God thinks to talk as we would uh, ourselves because of the way the world is described at the time he decided to destroy it by flood. We may get a pretty good picture of the thinking and viewpoint and attitude of God toward evil and when to correct it when we see him deal with Sodom and Gomorrah and at what point he did. And that goes also when he used the children of Israel to punish the uh, idolatrous tribes that occupied the land of Canaan that God gave to Israel. The point is, there is a day, and the Bible teaches it plainly, a day in our future somewhere coming when all evil 
and all suffering will finally be completely defeated. Now, therefore, hell helps answer the so-called philosophical problem, the problem of evil. I am completely content to let God deal with things as God. Why do I want to try to move myself from a mere finite, weak human being who needs the mercy and grace of God into God's position? How much do I know about even later this afternoon? How much do I know about an individual in China or one in Russia, or one in Indonesia. How do I know? Well, those people are there right now going through their lives just like we are right here now. God knows even the head of each one of them and the number of hairs on each one of them. He knows also who is trying to find him, who's using this life to find him, and his providential workings of things, he can lead that person to somebody that can teach him the truth. That's amazing. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7. God's promised that. He is in control. But because man's wicked, and I said this morning, and we'll continue to say it, this world is perfect for what God made it to be, a place to find God, a place to shape your character, your life in the likeness of Christ through your attitude and the study of God's will and to bring your life in subjection to his truth and we make our character a character that we'll take with us into eternity think of the song we just sang today will your attitude change about what you expressed in those songs and praise to God no when we talk about in our prayers the things that we have in mind relative to the good of every one of us as we're faithful to God and desiring each one of us to be in heaven and we pray God for forgiveness of our sins and we pray for strength there's a God in heaven and he hears our prayers the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much so James said I believe him and the Bible is saying the secret things belong unto God but the things that are revealed unto us and our children forever Deuteronomy 29 29 He's given me all that pertains to life and godliness, Peter said. And I know what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says about the, why we have a Bible. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. I'm perfectly content to let those things that belong to God be taken care of by God. But I'm very much concerned about me knowing my duty to God that I learn from His Word. And yet all of it will be taken care of when all evil, the devil and his angels, all evil at the end of the world is consigned to eternal torment. That's all it, folks. The problem of evil is gone. But you see, it doesn't fit the way people like to think, well, it ought to have been done yesterday. But there is no yesterday, today and tomorrow with God. It's just with us. And so we need to understand that when we begin to think about God and what he does and when he does it. Because there's no time governing God when he brings hell into reality or when he brings the world to an end and then the judgment day and consigns evil to hell and good, as the Bible defines it, to glory. Second, hell satisfies our longings for justice. Have you noticed that many people have no problem whatsoever? I say many, there may be some, but many people have no problem whatsoever with God who forgives our sins. Have you ever noticed that? While well, they got you go, you can be the most wicked person in the world, and some way you get forgiven in their mind. But the problem among these people is they don't like a God that punishes. And I may say something about punishment. Today we have been so twisted in our minds, in our lives, that we don't like to talk about a crime committed 
and somebody being just simply punish, punished because they committed a crime. We like to talk about rehabilitation. But there's no rehabilitation in hell. You used to have books like Crime and Punishment. But you've got to realize there's no getting out of hell. There's nothing but punishment. And punishment, the likes of which our minds can't grasp. So when we consider this, I've wondered why. Why would it be this way, especially in our day and age? Well, it may be more among our Western view of things, especially the United States, and how it's got into our culture over the last many years. Because most of us in the Western world live uh, pretty protected lives. We may not realize it. Sort of like spoiled kids. You never know you're spoiled and getting everything you want more. You just want more. <laughs> We're sort of like that in America. We have rights. Heard that discussed lately? Heard rights discussed? This nation's built on that. Have read the Constitution? Bill of Rights. Rights, rights, rights. My rights, your rights. Don't you infringe upon my rights. All these people running around the streets, even are living contrary to everything the Bible ever taught, they're still hard my rights. I always like the idea that says, your rights end where my nose begins. <laughs> There's a lot to that. Not very philosophically stated, but it does a pretty good job of saying something. We have rights, and that's what permeates us. It's a part of our culture. We don't, we don't think. We, we started from even when we were kids. You ever notice that? I'm going to tell my mom on you. Why? You took my sucker away, and that's mine. So we're brought up that way, rights. So have you noticed how much discussion in one way or the other, directly or indirectly, has to do with rights? In fact, I guess you would say, and I'll leave this here, that the whole USA is having to do with the rights of man. <laughs> it all came to existence because of all that. And thus, when those rights are violated, we look overall to government, properly constituted authority, for justice. There's our word. And when injustice takes place, we usually go to the appropriate law enforcement officer, enforcement agency. We'll let, that, we'll let John stand for that here. Or lawyers. It's always amazing to me, and I've said this to some of you, how much lawyers have all these jokes to tell about them and how terrible they are and all that. But you get in trouble, who do you go to? Even Paul said, you know, send the lawyer to me. He can be a benefit to me. Apostle Paul said that would be inspiration. We ought to think about that. Or government officials. And we go to them looking for them to make things right. Thus, it may be somewhat easier for us to, because we're so protected by rights, rights. We've become part of us. Our culture is that way. We're all around. Then, then maybe we scoff at divine justice when we're used to getting our human justice. Look around us and see what you're seeing. And you're seeing people cry out for more and more human justice. Whether they're right about it or not, that's not the point. Uh, you're still going to ask the question, why would anybody even be concerned about justice and just what is justice? But now I would have you note this. In past history, even but even today on this earth, there are those places where there's little to no human justice. And I suggest to you in those places where they know there's not going to be any human justice, that they still long for justice, but they long for divine justice. And they cry out for it. And you can see that in reading your Bible in the ages gone by. And you certainly can see it if you read history. Let me ask you this. What if God, who is love and a just God, what if God was not full of wrath because, that means wrathful, <laughs> Because of the evil in the world. Think about what kind of God that would mean. Do you get upset and even angry? Not that you don't control it. And what people do to one another? Would there be something wrong with us as Christians and following what we do in the Bible if we could not at least have a mental upsetness at unborn babies being ground up and pulled out 
and murdered? Does that bother anybody? There's something wrong with us if it doesn't. Then you have to ask the question, well, why does it bother me? And we're back to that old sense of oughtness and where it comes from. And it comes from the fact that God is the father of our inward man, our spirits, and we bear the stamp of our father, the moral imprint that outrages us when innocent, decent people, especially unborn babies, are dealt with as wicked people do. So why can we not realize God isn't wrathful in spite of being love? Because he is love, it automatically makes him full of wrath at evil things. People who go contrary to his will. People who cultivate living contrary to his will. People who are like Romans chapter 1 reveals the Gentiles became as they departed from God. Because all men one time believed in God. They all served God. But then they desired not to retain God in their knowledge. And God gave them up. And it lists all of the wicked things they did. You think God's happy about that? Well, he's got his love. Yes. And because he is love and cares for mankind, when mankind chooses to go contrary to his will and be wicked, then God's not a happy camper. God's vengeful side comes up, and no wonder then he said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Why? I'm all-knowing. I know all this object of knowledge. I know exactly, and I'm without bias. There's no prejudice on my part. If you want to see a person perfectly judged, let God do it. Nothing's hidden. Everything is seen in its proper perspective. That's the one that has the right to meet out vengeance. But on who? On those who are wicked. On those who are evil. So because many people have a wrong concept of what love is, they think a God of retribution cannot be a God who is love. So you have some people saying, well, that God of the Bible is Old Testament. It's a wrathful God. God of the New Testament is a loving God. Well, they haven't studied very closely. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. So Jesus, who said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, said to those hypocrites and hard-hearted characters in the temple, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a liar from the beginning and a murderer. So there's a place for the devil and his angels when all wickedness is destroyed. So what kind of a monster would God be if he were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make the final end of violence? God, I declare unto you, and it needs to be affirmed and debated, God is full of wrath. Because he is love. A God who's indifferent towards injustice would not be good. It's precisely because God is good that he punishes the guilty. The goodness of God then requires a final, complete judgment. It's a manifestation of the perfect justice of of God. From where then does the longing and search for justice come in the hearts of people? Where does it come from? That sense of oughtness, where did that come from? From God. And so you got people all over the country. They may be as wrong as they could be in what they're desiring, but in the name of justice they seek it and they don't even think to ask, why do I think this is an injustice? Why do I think there ought to be justice? They may be as ignorant as an acre and concerning what the Bible says. Well, then why is it? Why is it that they seek justice? What makes them seek justice? What makes them invent laws that govern even the treatment of people? And so on. From their hearts, people cry out. 
for ultimately and finally perfect justice. But here's the thing they don't know, and we need to know it. Listen, there is no perfect justice in this world. Why, if our government was the best government on the face of the earth as far as it being run right and everybody up there was as honest as I say up there, you know where I mean, Washington, or you can talk about Austin if you want to, or Houston, whatever the type of government, everybody there was exactly what they ought to be. There's not going to be any perfect, perfect uh, justice in this world. Do your best to vote in who you want to vote in. There's not going to be any perfect justice. That doesn't take place here. It never was meant to be here. But God's not governed by time. He's not governed by the way this world works. So only God can provide perfect justice. This is why people say, and this is interesting to me, these that don't have any idea about the Bible or the justice of God or spiritual things, and they're out there on the street with something going, no justice, no peace. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. No justice, no peace. Well, where did they get an idea like that? How did it crop up in their mind? If there's no God, there's not going to be any final justice. No reason there should be. Now here's what it comes down to. And this is the truth of the matter. If there's no final judgment, there is no ultimate justice. And if there is no ultimate justice... There is no eternal peace. So we must realize this is God's world, as the song said. And all the humans are created in the image of God, not physically, but spiritually. There is that then within humans that demands that those responsible for injustice stand before a judge and pay for their crimes. That's what justice has to do with. In other words, there is that sense of oughtness that is imprinted on our spirits because God is the Father of our spirits. But here's the terrible reality. Every single solitary one of us are, are responsible for injustice. Every one of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6.23. Therefore, when we all stand before the judgment bar of Christ, we'll give, give an account of the deeds done in the body, the wrong deeds. The books will be opened. There will be, a, to, to describe it like the Bible does, and there's a list, if you want to call it that, of every sin we've ever committed. Oh, God misses nothing. Elders might. <laughs> Your mom and daddy might. Son or daughter might. God doesn't. Now, folks, that's the bad news. That is the bad news. But it's like old Gabriel Heater. Some of y'all have no idea who he is, a radio announcer of 80 years ago, I guess. He'd come on and say, oh, there's good news tonight. Are you beginning to catch that good news? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's good news that he's talking about. That's the fundamental meaning of gospel. And it's the, that good news, the power of God to save us from sin. We don't have to go to hell. And the Bible says God doesn't want you to. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise to some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's a wonderful thought. First Corinthians fifteen, one through four. Scripture reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now just think about this in contradistinction to the place of hell. And the justice of God meted out to those who die lost. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve, and so on He goes. The same gospels in the same book, the Bible, and we preach it today. It's the power of God to save us from our sins, Romans 1, 16. That's the good news. So there's another book when I read the book of books, the Word of God, called the Book of Life. Read about it, Revelation 20, 12, 15. It's also a record book. And the names of those who, though fully guilty of sin, have by their own desire received mercy. They've been forgiven of their sins because they from the heart believed the gospel and obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered then. Them being then made free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness, Romans 16 and 17. That form of doctrine is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Just read it, 1 Corinthians 15. And we're baptized into the death of Christ. And we're raised to walk in newness of life. We receive all that blessing that God through Christ did for us. We never could do for ourselves when he died on Calvary. Offering his body a pure sacrifice. His blood shed for the remission of sins. So these have remained faithful through their life. Having been added to the church by the Lord. And they die. Revelation 2.10. Say. They have an eternity in heaven with God when it's all over. And the sin problem and the problem of evil is solved. And the glorification of mankind is done. And it's all bound up in the wisdom of the Almighty. It's too great for me. So in the final judgment, there are two options for everybody. Either one accepts Jesus Christ by belief of the gospel and the terms of pardon set out in it that involve the body offered, his body, though tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, thus he's the Lamb of God. He could die for somebody else and offer his body for our benefit and shed his blood for the remission of sins and pay our debt. Or we have the other choice. Go to hell and pay our own debt. But there's no end to that. And that tells us how terrible sin is in God's sight because he is a just God. And the infinite wisdom of the Almighty, God's so loving that he has to punish evil, but his love also allowed him to manifest his favor and his great mercy in Jesus Christ. So Jesus became a man and did what we couldn't do. He was tempted at every point like as we are. So he could die on our behalf. And so redeem us, buy us back, so that we could see the whole scheme of things someday from a safe standpoint and glorified in heaven. So there's perfect mercy through the gospel and our belief and obedience to it. Or perfect justice when the evil, problem of evil, is solved forevermore. That to me is quite interesting. And if you want to know the whole thing of it, I never give much thought along that line until just recently. And when I learn something, you'll see that it's nothing new. That was in the Bible all along. But I saw in it what I hadn't seen before. And I hope you can see it too. Because there's a day coming when God will make it all smooth. And those who love and keep his commandments here will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. But for those who serve Satan, depart from me. I never knew you. And their everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Nobody wants to hear that if they're honest with themselves. If you're subject to the Lord's call to obey the gospel, live righteous. And we invite you to come while we stand and sing.